Hi everyone, in this lecture we're going to cover selected material from chapter 7 of your text. In this chapter we're looking again at long-term memory, but this time we're looking at encoding, retrieval, and consolidation. Now we'll look at how we get information into long-term memory. The first thing we do is encode, and this is where we're acquiring information from the environment, and we transform it into a memory. Now later on if we want to use this information we have to retrieve it from long-term memory and this is where we're actually transferring that information from long-term memory into working memory so we can use it in the present. Now there's a few ways in which we can try to um, get information into long-term memory. We can use um, a couple of different types of rehearsals. One of which is maintenance rehearsal and this is um, very common. Um, the thing about maintenance rehearsal is is that it doesn't actually transfer um, any kind of information into long-term memory. And, then, and maintenance rehearsal again is where we just repeat stimuli over and over again. And this helps us maintain information in the short term, but it doesn't actually help us transfer it into long-term memory. So a good example is if you're trying to remember a phone number and you're repeating those digits over and over again. You can do this many, many times, but as soon as you dial that number and you use that information, that information's gone. So when you use something like maintenance rehearsal, you're just maintaining it basically long enough to use it. But once it's used, it's kind of gone. It doesn't actually get transferred into long-term memory. If we want something to make it into long-term memory, we need to do something called elaborative rehearsal. And this is where we use meanings or other connections that we already have in long-term memory to help transfer the information we have right now into our long-term memory. Now if we look at levels of processing theory, uh, this particular theory says that memory depends on how information is encoded. Specifically we look at the depth of processing that occurs when we're trying to get information into long-term memory. We can have shallow processing and this is where we are paying very little attention to the meaning of the information that we're trying to encode. Um, we're focusing more on the just the basic physical features of the information and typically what we see with shallow processing is poorer memory later on. And this is in contrast to deep processing. This is where we're paying really close attention to the meaning of the information or the semantics. And this really um, leads to better memory in the long term. So if we want to really pass information on to long term memory um, so somewhat successfully, we want to use deeper processing rather than more shallow processing, according to this theory. Here's one example of the levels of processing theory being tested. And here in this particular example, participants were asked to um, tell whether or not a word they pre were presented with had capital letters. So the rule was given um, whether or not to report um, if there were capital letters in the word that they were presented. Then they would be presented um, bird, for example. And then, of course, the answer to this would be no. There's no capital letters. So participants would participate in this uh, particular condition, so capital letters. They would also have a rhyming condition, and last would be fill-in-the-blank condition. And according to levels of processing theory, the deeper level of processing would occur with fill-in-the-blanks rather than with rhyming or capital letters. And later on, after participants um, participated in each of these different conditions, they were asked to um, basically recall or what their memory was of the different words and things like that that they experienced during the task and what they found was that the participants that were in the fill in the blanks category had better memory of what they were presented with whereas the rhyming and especially the capital letters condition there was really um, not very good memory if really much of any memory at all particularly in this condition here so this was taken as some support for the levels of processing theory now, at this particular example that I just gave you, we have to be aware of what we call circular reasoning. So, basically, we have to think about it like this. Here, the depth of processing has not really been defined independently of memory performance, meaning that we could say that the people in the fill-in-the-blank condition are doing better on the memory task after the actual study because they processed things at a deeper level, or you could say that they... Um, process things at a deeper level because they performed better. So which is it? You can't really separate one from the other. The actual performance on the task or the level which they processed the material when they encoded it. So because of this, um, we, we're really looking at something called circular reasoning. So we can't tell if it's one thing or the other thing. And with studies like this, we have to be careful of this. When we can't tease apart performance from the actual effect itself, then we have something to be concerned about.
Now, moving on to other things that affect or can aid in coding. Visual imagery we know helps. In this particular example here, we have participants in either a repetition group or an imagery group. And the repetition group is told to just repeat paired words over and over again. So boat, tree, boat, tree, boat, tree, for example. And this is their percent um, correct and recall. Now, if we look at the imagery group, they're actually told to group a boat and a tree together to make a visual image. And what we see is better recall when visual imagery is used versus repetition. There's also something called the self-reference effect. And in this particular um, um, type of encoding, basically people are told to um, associate words that they're trying to remember with themselves in some way. So, for example, if you're trying to remember the word happy, you might say that you are happy. So you basically link all the words or items to be remembered to yourself. The next is called the generation effect, and this is where the subject actually is told to generate some information to link to the items to be remembered. And we find that this works better than if the participants are given information to link to words they're trying to remember. So basically, if you're generating items to link to the items you're trying to um memorize, you're going to do better than if somebody else is giving you that information. So fill in the blank and things like that, that's an example of the generation effect because you're actually having to come up with something to link to the item to remember. We can also look at organizing to be remembered information. So this is where we are, um, for example, studying information that's organized. Um, so we could do this with a story balloon or something like this. So basically we're trying to organize in some way information we need to remember. And we find that if there is some sort of organization of this information, then it is better remembered. We can also um, relate words somewhat to survival value. So things that might be especially meaningful or helpful for us to have in order to survive. This could be potentially helpful. And last would be um, just practice and retrieval. So this is um, basically being tested um, more frequently. Um, this can lead to better memory over time rather than just rereading materials. So basically testing yourself more often um, and making yourself have to retrieve that information more often, having more practice with this, typically improves memory. Now we can look at um, some organization and comprehension in memory with this um, Bransford and Johnson study. So if we're looking at difficult to comprehend information, they split participants into three separate groups. So they had um, experimental group one, and this group saw a picture that helped explain the story information before they read the story. Experimental two um, group saw the picture after they read the passage, and the control group didn't see the picture at all. And what they found was that group one outperformed the other groups. And this is just kind of lending support that having some sort of mental framework for comprehension of difficult to understand or comprehend information aids memory encoding and retrieval. So here's an example of the picture that those participants were shown. So again, um, what you can see, there's a lot going on in this picture. And you can imagine that if you were shown this picture first before you read the story, it might help you um, understand what's kind of going on in the story a bit more than if you were shown this picture after the fact or even worse that you weren't shown this picture at all. Here we'll look at retrieval practice. So again we'll focus on um, basically a testing effect. So again which results in stronger memory trace? Rereading material you've read before or being tested on material? Um, and this is a, just one study that's been done on this effect. This is what's done in 06, and they had participants read a passage and then either reread the passage or take a recall test. And, um, and then uh, this, uh, both groups were tested um, after a long delay. And what they found was that the testing group performed better than the reread group. And this is um, some evidence for the testing effect. Or that basically if you're trying to study for an exam, for example, and you're just rereading the same material over and over again, you're likely not to do as well as a student who is actually reading the material and then trying to test themselves periodically throughout their study session. The student who is testing themselves more often will typically have a stronger memory trace for that material and will perform better on a subsequent exam.
And here's the, the actual data from that study. So we have um, testing after five minutes, two days, or a week. And we have the rereading group in green. And we have the testing group in orange. And what we see is a sharper decline as a function of time or delay in the rereading group just overall. And what we see more long term, so this is just five minutes. Okay, so the reread group does a bit better than the testing group and then very, very immediacy. But what we find even just two days after that is a big, huge shift. The testing group does substantially better than the rereading group, and this maintains throughout. And we also see a more drastic drop in performance in the rereading group than we do in the testing group, which is a more, you know, not nearly as steep a slope and decline of performance as a function of time. Now, if we look at more specifically how we retrieve information from long-term memory, um, again, retrieval is the process of transferring information from the long-term memory um, store back into working memory. Um, we can say this is some evidence of consciousness. Um, but also we have to keep in mind that most of our failures of memory are failures to actually retrieve information. Now, if we look at ways in which we could be um, told to recall information, so we could have an instance in which we have queued recall. So we have a queue presented to aid our recall. Um, and what we find is that when we have a queued recall, we see increased performance over free recall. Um, and also, retrieval queues in general, they're most effective when they're generated or created by the person who's using them versus when they're created by someone else. So how do we help in retrieving information from long-term memory and moving it back into working memory? Have recall be queued and also try to, when possible, use queues that the person has created or generated themselves. And now we'll focus on encoding. and with encoding specificity, this is suggesting that we learn information together along with the context in which we're learning the information. And we can see this as an example in Baddeley's 75 um, study looking at um, context in which information is learned or encoded. And we can call this the diving experiment. And what they found here in this particular study was that the best recall of information occurred when encoding and retrieval occurred in the same location. And on this slide, we'll take a look at the different um, conditions that Baddeley used. So he had a study um, context and then a testing context. So um, here, if we take a look at this, um, participants who studied underwater and then were tested underwater did better than those that were studying underwater and tested on land. And we see this effect all the way through the conditions. So if someone studied on land, they did better on land when tested than they did when they were tested underwater. And this is just the same all the way across. So basically, this is just kind of giving evidence that when you are studying versus when you're tested, if those contexts match, you're likely to perform better when you're tested. Kind of similar, but a bit different, we can move to state-dependent learning. So this is where we're focusing on your internal state when you learn something. And the suggestion with state-dependent learning is that if your emotional state when you have to retrieve information or when you're being tested is similar or the same as it was when you learned it or encoded that information, you're likely to be more successful at retrieval. So, for example, better memory if a person's mood we can say uh, matches encoding versus retrieval. So if you're happy during encoding and happy during retrieval, you're likely to do better than if you were happy during encoding and then angry during retrieval, for example. Now we're looking really quickly at ways in which we can improve our learning or encoding and memory. And here we're looking at different ways of practicing or studying. Um, we can look at distributed versus mass practice. And distributed is where we are doing what is typically recommended um, when we are taking longer periods of time and studying intermittently throughout those long periods. So studying the weeks leading up to an exam. So we're taking different sections of time, smaller sections of time to study, and we're having breaks in between study sessions versus mass practice is where we're basically doing cramming. So you have an exam in a day, you're going to cram all day today and take the exam tomorrow. That would be cramming. Now what we know is that it can be difficult to maintain close attention throughout a long study session. So if you're having a long cram session, it can just be really hard to maintain close attention for that long of a period of time. So you're likely to get really distracted and really not get as much out of that time period as you might think you would. 
versus if you actually are doing distributing practicing and you're studying um, in smaller increments of time and taking breaks in between, um, taking a break can kind of give you feedback when you come back about what you already know. So when you come back after a break, if something is still really present in your mind and you feel confident with it, then it kind of is giving you feedback that you are probably okay with that particular chunk of information. So you're also getting, you know, kind of not only um, good use of your time when you're doing distributed practice, but you're also getting feedback when you come back after a break about what you already know versus what you might want to focus more on. So overall, distributed practice is much more recommended. Now we'll take a look at memory consolidation, and this is what happens when we transform a new memory from a very fragile new state to a more permanent state in long-term memory. So when we have a new memory, it is very fragile, um, but basically through consolidation, um, we're moving it into a more permanent state for storage and recall later on. So um, this type of synaptic consolidation again occurs at the synapses and it happens very quickly and it also involves gradual reorganization of circuits in the brain. So there's, there's an actual structural change in the brain when we are moving this information into a more permanent state. Um, and we can look at some evidence for this in this uh, 1900 study. So this was a very important study, a very early study. What they did here was quite simple. So they had an immediate group and a delay group of participants. And what they did was present both groups with two lists of words to learn. So they presented in the immediate group both lists back to back. So list one and list two, no delay between them. And then they presented for the delay group list one and then gave them six minutes in between list one and list two and then gave them list two. And then after they did both of this in each group, they tested each group for um, the list one words. And what they found was that recall in the delay group for list one was better than it was for the immediate group. And the explanation here is that for the intermediate group, the consolidation of list one was interrupted by immediately presenting list two. Whereas for the delay group, they actually had six minutes to consolidate list one. So that's their explanation for why memory for list one in the delay group was stronger than it was for the immediate group. So studies like this really kind of lended us to this idea, um, one you know here just presented by Heaven48, um, the idea that learning and memory is represented in the brain by actual physiological changes at the synapse, meaning that there are structural changes that are occurring at the synapse gap between neurons. So basically, you know, your brain structure is changing when things are moved to being a more um, permanent state in long-term memory. We're actually seeing some sort of a physiological change in the brain or specifically at the synapse. And now we'll look at how this actually kind of uh, works at the synapse. So we're looking at LTP or long-term potentiation here. So this is um, enhanced firing of neurons after repeated stimulation. So um, and this is kind of what is more responsible for the structural changes and enhanced responding we see in the brain. So these physiological structures that are occurring after consolidation, um, this is kind of how it's occurring. So this again, this idea of long-term potentiation. So with repeated practice, with repeated use, um, you're actually having more firing of neurons being repeated because there's repeated stimulation. So consolidation is happening. So we're having more firing of neurons and repeated stimulation. So this is really encouraging that structural change in the synapse and um, enhancing responding. Here we'll take a look at a figure that kind of demonstrates what we're talking about with long-term potentiation. So this increased firing over time. So here we have um, neuron A and neuron B, and we have this synapse here, right? So this gap between the two of them. And this would be the first presentation of a stimulus. So we have a bit of communication here. And if we have continued presentation of that stimulus, we're going to have more communication. And then eventually we're going to have structural changes that occur. Um, as a function of this um, increased firing or increased presentation of the stimulus, over time we're going to see structural changes to A and to B. So here we'll take a look at how fragile new memories can be. So 
for um, specifically amnesia. Most of you all have definitely heard of amnesia. You know it's a loss of memory, but there are two different types of amnesia. The first of which is anterior grade. So this would be um, loss of memory or inability to form new memory um, past a certain point of injury or trauma that has occurred to a person. Um, so basically they incur some sort of trauma, injury, something happens, and they're not able to form any new long-term memories after that. Um, conversely, retrograde amnesia is the loss of memory for events prior to the trauma. So here's our trauma or injury to the person. Basically, they're having issues with memory uh, before the injury. So they're not having issues with forming new long-term memories, just recalling information that occurred before the injury. And now we'll take a look at something called graded amnesia. So this is a bit more specific. This is looking at memory for recent events. Um, and the fact that what we find with a, a fair number of patients is that um, memory for more recent events or events that occurred fairly close in time to the actual injury or trauma point tend to be more forgotten than ones that are further away or um, further back in time from the injury or trauma point. So um, these lines are indicating that here. So these, th this item here, these items in this in this range and further out would be more likely to be remembered by the person whereas these right here these events would be less likely to be remembered by that person now we have to wonder and some people I'm sure would argue that of course they are but our memories ever permanent and we do have some evidence of reactivation and reconsolidation from research that we've done on animals um, and we know that this does occur again under certain conditions so what this really tells us is that human memory is always a work in progress I would argue that no memory is ever truly permanent and no memory is ever going to be perfectly set the way that it is in, in any one point in time it's always subject to change, subject to being gone forever, subject to restructuring, reactivation, reconsolidation. Um, basically, we just have to acknowledge that all of this stuff is a work in progress. Lastly, back to improving learning and memory. So, some tips for you guys. When we are actually trying to improve our learning and memory, we can elaborate. So, this is where we are associating what you're learning to what you already know. So taking items that you already have in long-term memory, things you already know, and making associations between new information you're trying to learn and that information that you already know. Also generation effect. So generate and test. So generate yourself cues and things like this to help you memorize um, information, but then also test yourself. Test yourself often. This will help you um, when it comes time to actually taking a quiz or a test. And also, guys, take breaks. Don't cram. Don't do that. Um, and this is also referred to as the spacing effect. And this, again, is where we're seeing memory um, being better in multiple short study sessions rather than one really long one. Take several you know, short study sessions throughout a week or whatever and study during those times. Don't do a long cram session regardless of what class it is. You will perform better if you do short study sessions versus one long cramming session. Um, this would be the case just over long term. And also we do know that consolidation is enhanced if you sleep after studying. So basically, guys, no all-nighters. It's not helping you out. Um, consolidation, um, right, at the synapse, we find is really enhanced. It helps if you sleep. Um, it really helps the process, and it helps solidify what you're studying. So if you're doing an all-nighter, you're really doing yourself a disservice. And last, and I think one of the most important things, is to avoid the illusion of learning. So just because something looks familiar to you or sounds familiar to you does not mean you know it. Familiarity does not mean that you've actually comprehended that information. And I think everyone at some point has fallen victim to that. Oh, that looks familiar. Oh, I know I've seen that before. I'm fine with that. That's cool. You know, test me on it. And, you know, we get tested on it, then we don't know it because we have this illusion of learning. So again, don't fall victim to that. You know, just because it looks familiar or sounds familiar doesn't mean you know it. All right, that's all for this chapter, guys. Make sure, as always, to look at the chapter very carefully, and I'll be back with you all next week with Chapter 8. Have a great week.